Okay. Hi, Emil. How are you doing? Hi, Chelsea. I am great. Very good. Uh, so I'll just kick off. Uh, I guess maybe we can start with you just telling us a bit about Neo4j and the FinCEN files in case anyone missed that in the news. Sure. So let me start with Neo4j. Um, so at the highest level, we're a database company. Um, we were founded in, this is, I guess, Web Summit in Europe. We were founded in, in Sweden, uh, but we're headquartered in Silicon Valley. And we're, we have about, I think, probably 400 people right now spread out across uh, North American Europe primarily. And uh, we're uh, growing fast in Asia as, as well, but primarily North American Europe right now. Um, the company is founded on... Uh, an extremely simple premise, which is the following. The world is becoming increasingly connected, which is hardly a controversial statement. We're doing this interview now. I guess it, in, in normal times, it would have been you know, face-to-face -face in, in, in Lisbon. Now it's, it's over Zoom, right? We're all constantly connected, becoming even more so every day. So hardly a controversial statement. However, the consequence of that is slightly more subtle, which is that as, as the world is becoming more connected, so is information, right? Why? Well, because information or data is ultimately describing the world. And so when the world is becoming more connected, data is becoming more connected. And that's not a problem per se. The challenge is that for 30, 40 years, all of us have been using software systems that have been based on a simple, very very foundational piece of technology called the relational database or the SQL database, which stores information in tables. And that's awesome. It's fantastic. It's good for a lot of different things. Um, however, what it, however, what it isn't good for is capturing information that is connected. Um, and we are optimized for that. So when you have data that is trying to figure out how information piece A is connected to information piece B, uh, and I'll go into more details later, for example, with the fence and files. Uh, but when you have that type of, of, of data, then a graph database like Neo4j is frequently a thousand times or even a million times faster than traditional uh, SQL databases. Okay, great. Um, and maybe just about the FinCEN files then specifically, isn't that? Yeah, so th this is one of those uh, stories that I think in probably any other year, it would have gotten massive circulation, right? I mean, you're a journalist. Yeah, I, I think you would probably agree with that. But there's been a lot of things going on, COVID and so on and so forth this year. Uh, but what it is, is one of the biggest um, investigative journalism uh, news stories ever. And what FinCEN stands for, FinCEN is kind of a weird name. It stands for Financial Crime Enforcement Network. So that's FinCEN, which is actually an organization inside the U.S. Department of Treasury. And they are tasked with, with fin finding man money laundering, both domestically inside of the U.S., but also internationally. Um, and there was a leak of information, just a tiny slice of, uh, of the information that the FinCEN organization uh, has been accumulating over the past 15 or so years. Uh, that was leaked to a, a site called BuzzFeed, and it chronicles these um, money laundering investigations done by some of these big global banks. So it's really talking about how is money coming from some kind of a criminal, potentially criminal activity, and is getting laundered into becoming legal, legit money, so to speak, which is one of those informations that one of those situations where money is flowing not directly from one point to another point, but it's flowing through a network, which of course in our world is also called a graph. Mm. So what is it then about graph databases rather than relational databases that makes it easier for people to understand the money trails and the sort of relationships between the entities that are passing on the, the money? Yeah, it's a good question. So whenever you start thinking about data and information, you figure out, hey, is this a good fit for like a, a classic traditional, you know, SQL database or one of these new kids on the block, which we are, we, which we are one of them, for example, graph databases, right? You should start thinking about the shape of the data and what type of questions you want to, to figure out. So in this case, you could take those, um, uh, the, the reports of potential investigations and you could look at them and you could sort them by title, for example, or you could calculate the average of how much dollars were associated with them. And that would be fantastic for Excel or an SQL database for tables, right? 
But if you want to figure out how it's all connected, if you want to try to make sense of it, then that is about a, this thing started out in Stockholm, Sweden, right? To take a local example for myself. And then money was transferred through a bank in London to a, a merchandise in Detroit and then transferred back to somewhere, right? And if you want to start trail that and trace that across multiple hops, that's a fantastic fit uh, for, for a graph database. Interesting. And so when all this information uh, about these sort of suspicious transactions were put into the graph database, could queries highlight things like weaknesses in the regulations, in the banking system, uh, any kind of loopholes that allow people to, to transfer money, which otherwise, you know, might not have slipped through the cracks? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And, and I think that I'm, I'm firmly of the belief that, that most people want to do good. I, I'm not naive, not everyone, not all the time, right? But most people want to do good. And most institutions, these big banks, it's in their own best self-interest to, to follow the law and, and do the right thing, right? Um, but sometimes you have to invest in systems, invest in processes, so, so to speak, ahead of the curve in order to be able to capture these things. And I think that's what some of these institutions, what, what the FinCEN files show is that that's what some of these institutions really have failed to do. In many situations, if not all situations that we've seen in the FinCEN files, the data was there. It was possible to figure out that, wait, it, no, you shouldn't just look at this as a transaction from ML to Chelsea, right? That's not enough. You can't just look at from A to B, just that little thing, right? Uh, you have to look at from Chelsea to someone else, and then someone else to someone else, and, someone, and so on and so forth. You have to trace it all the way down from the root cause, so to speak, the root origin, all the way to its destination. And in order to do that, you have to have technologies that are shaped that way, that allow you to look at things that way. And this is something that we saw very deeply as well with the, with the Panama Papers, right? Which was the first time that, well, actually it wasn't the first time, it was the first and most public event that these, this journalist organization called the ICIJ that is behind the FinCEN files. That was the, the most public um, use of, of graph databases uh, to date, where they were able to see this tax, potential tax fraud that was that happened, not, not because someone hid something, uh, a politician hid it directly in an offshore bank account, but it was connected indirectly through that, through multiple hops out. Mm. And is that a sort of limitation from the bank's perspective, because they only see a small section of that trail where these sort of investigations uh, so informative because you suddenly see a much bigger picture when you can piece all of those those reports that come from different banks, from different people, from different countries. You can piece that all together, and maybe you know you can use graph databases even internally within the banks to look at uh, how suspicious these transactions potentially are. And you can look at the bigger picture, but actually they're looking at a very small part of it, and maybe that makes it difficult. That's exactly right. I mean, I think the, the specific answer to your question is yes and no, in the sense that they actually have all the information, right? The data is already there. What, what we've seen right now in the news with the FinCEN files is a small group of data journalists who have looked at information and they sit on the outside and they're able to unravel all these stories and tell these stories about money laundering at the biggest banks in the world, right? Whereas the teams they have internally, tens of thousands of engineers and developers and data scientists, right, with access to all the information, they couldn't, they couldn't figure that out. And why? Because they were using the wrong technologies. They were using the wrong tools for it. Mm. And I guess, yeah, we, we don't have long for this chat, but maybe we can just think, like, how many times do these kind of links, these leaks need to happen before actual regulators and governments do enough to stop it from happening and journalists not have to keep doing these types of huge investigations. Yeah, I, I think I guess uh, I'll take a, a simultaneously glass half full and glass half empty view on that. I think, I think incrementally year after year, things are getting better. We certainly saw um, a big step up after the 2008, right, in the financial crisis. When the Swiss leaks happened in 2015, there was a big step up after the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. We, we, we saw real improvement. 
but on some level i feel like journalists probably for a while at least will stay ahead of the game which on some level is the purpose right like you you want that that those journalists i mean i'm talking to a journalist here right like to to be that that um that forcing function that pressure from the outside to hold hold uh, these firms accountable as well as the government right and i think that's a healthy tension that probably will stay for for quite some time so i, I guess that's my my simultaneously glass half full and glass half empty uh perspective on on that well thank you emma that was really interesting and uh, i think that's us done for this session but uh everyone else i guess can enjoy the rest of the summit Thank you. Bye-bye. All right.